Hi folks, and welcome to the Meaningful Money Podcast. This is season 16, episode six. This is the podcast dedicated to helping you put your finances in order. My name is Pete Matthew, and I'm going to share with you everything you need to know and everything you need to do to secure your financial future. I'm here to help you make sense of money. Here we go. Once again, great to have you with me. Thank you so much for joining me. Now, I don't care how rich you are. It is impossible to overlook the importance of cash flow in your financial planning. There is a reason that lottery winners and premiership footballers sometimes go bankrupt. If you are spending more than is coming in, you're getting poorer. It's just fact. And as you prepare for retirement, you're really going to need to get a grip on your cash flow. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. As usual, after the main body of the show, I'll be looking at recent reviews that have been left. Announce what we're going to be talking about next time. Quick ad for Meaningful Academy towards the end as well. But before any of that, remember, as you know well by now, this podcast continues to be brought to you with the help of my friends at Seven Investment Management. They've been helping me out for ages now, since the spring of 2011, which is just incredible. So please do check out what they're up to. They're at 7im.co.uk. That's the number 7im.co.uk. Now, as we build wealth throughout our working lives, cash flow is obviously important, right? Unless we spend less than we earn, we'll never build anything, except by relying on others in the form of inheritances or pools wins or whatever. But as we plan our retirement, we'll no longer be earning in the true sense of the word. So this is going to need a bit of a change of mindset and how we think about the money that passes through our hands, as well as the wealth that we have built. So remember, notes and links from today's show, they're at the show notes. It's the only link you need to remember. If you're out and about listening to this, you don't need to write it down. You can remember this, meaningfulmoney.tv slash HS6. That's for home straight That's the name of this season, episode six, meaningfulmoney.tv slash HS6. Let's have a look at what you need to know first. Keep crashing my own voice with my (laughs) sound effects. Must get better at that. Uh, By the way, new in-ear monitors this week, so you should see me fiddling with my ears a little bit less, which is good for all concerned. So the first thing we need to know is to think about total return rather than just income. So like I say, when we're earning an income from work, income is an easy enough concept to understand. We work nine till five, we get paid at the end of the month, simple. If we've got money in the bank, it pays interest, that's income. If we've got a rental property or two, then they produce rent, that's an income, dead easy to understand. In retirement, there's likely still to be some part of our cash flow that is in that form of income. You've heard me use the phrase secured income before. DB pensions the state pension, continuing rental income maybe, and maybe even income from work still in retirement. But to a greater or lesser extent, we are going to be supplementing that income with withdrawals from capital. Now, in my experience as a financial planner working with clients at this particular time in their lives, in the great sort of transition into retirement, this takes very often something of a mental leap for a lot of people to get their head around. I mean, if you think about it, they've been building wealth furiously for so long, The thought of flipping that around and now actually starting to make withdrawals from their portfolio is just anathema. Now, if your cash flow needs can be met entirely by the natural income of your portfolio, that'd be great. You would have no need to dip into the portfolio ever. But for most of us, that's probably unlikely simply because of the numbers we would need in order to produce a reliable natural income. The size of the portfolio would need to be pretty big. Now, in a couple of weeks' time, I'm going to be discussing in detail how to position your portfolio for longevity, right? After all, if we are going to dip into our money, we need to make sure that it never runs out, if we can help it. But for now, I think we just need to understand the interplay between these three things. Firstly, natural income, which is the income, if you like, thrown off by your investments. Interest from cash and bonds, dividends from equities, rent from property. That's natural income, and it's distinct from the value of the underlying assets that produce it. Next is total return. That's the combination of income and capital growth. 
often natural income is reinvested to buy more of the capital, uh, the capital appreciating asset. So when you see a fact sheet for an investment fund, you will see usually the natural income expressed as a percentage yield, but the performance figures usually include that in their sort of annual returns, along with the growth of the underlying assets. So that's total return. And then finally, withdrawals, right? That's either ad hoc or regular withdrawals of capital over time. To do so obviously requires selling down assets, and so it needs to be timed carefully where possible. Chances are you're going to need to make some withdrawals from capital as you enter retirement, and that will, by definition, erode your capital. And that's the second thing we need to know. Erosion of capital is okay, right? It's not the worst thing in the world. Now, again, this requires a mindset, uh, mindset shift. If you are a follower of the FIRE doctrine, you'll be quite comfortable with the idea of the value of your amassed wealth declining over time as you spend and enjoy it. But for many of my clients, I have to really work hard with them on this. It's okay, it's desirable even, to erode the value of your capital over time. No point dying rich after all. But there's two important caveats to that. Firstly, you don't wanna be dipping in too heavily when markets and hence the value of your investments are down. Ideally, you'd only take money out when the portfolio is in profit, but that might be tricky to get, uh, tricky rather, to get the timing absolutely right. And secondly, you don't want the money to erode completely too quickly. In short, you don't really want to outlive your money. Of course, the difficulty is that we've no idea when we're going to die, right? If we did, then we could plan our spending spectacularly well and have a massive great blowout the day before we shuffled off. But we don't know when that date will be, so we can't plan it, which is a bummer. I'm sure you'll agree. Now, I find that many people are uncomfortable with the idea of capital erosion because they don't really have any sense of whether or not their money will last so this can be uh, quite useful with the um, the 4% rule that many of us know about. Uh, this That rule can be handy in this situation. The 4% rule says that in most circumstances, if you withdraw 4% of your capital each year, then it won't run out, okay? That's obviously a massive oversimplification, but it does serve a purpose. Personally, I'd like to be a bit more scientific than that, and we will get to that later in the season and also in next season, a little heads up there. But as we don't know the date of our eventual demise, we're going to need to make an assumption about it. And in my experience, most people significantly underestimate their own longevity. I think that might be a function of the way we look at and remember the previous generations to us. And we also forget that life expectancy is actually pretty good these days. It's improved massively over the last 50 to 100 years. So... Promise me at this point that you'll try to get comfortable with the idea of spending your own money. That really is what you've been building for all these years anyway, right? So if you haven't yet, I highly recommend reading a book called Beyond the 4% Rule by previous guest of the show and good friend of mine, Abraham Okasanya. There's a link to that in the notes. Highly recommend it. Third thing you need to know is that spending generally reduces as retirement goes on. There's been a few studies into this, uh, into sort of retirement spending, but I think one of the most influential is um, the one which was conducted by the International Longevity Center in 2015 called Understanding Retirement Journeys, Expectation versus Reality. There's a link in the notes to the report, which is fascinating. But let me sort of summarize it by saying that in the main, spending reduces as we get older. If you're anything like me, that's probably in line with what you might expect. But in my experience with clients who are retiring, the first five years or so tend to be the most expensive. Why? Because we tend to use the time and the resources that we've suddenly find ourselves uh, having available, particularly tax-free cash very often thrown off by pensions and the time that we've got because we're not working anymore. You know, we take holidays, buy camper vans and boats and we fix up the house and we use the resources to do all those things. Now, only you know what your plans are, but as we think about cash flow in retirement, it can sometimes be helpful to think in five-year blocks of time. Chances are that the most expensive five years will be the first five years, and then in each five-year block, your spending will decline somewhat. 
The ILC study even found that as spending declines, saving increases. Imagine that, saving in retirement. I think they found that the average 80-year-old uh, household was saving about five and a half grand a year. It's not bad, is it? You know, sort of uh, 475 quid a month or something like that, 450. And imagine if you're approaching retirement, you're not thinking about saving in later life. But that seems to be what happens. Now, if we accept that the first five years are likely to be the most expensive, then we need to remember that probably those same five years will be probably the lightest in terms of the secured income that we've got. So maybe our state pension won't have kicked in yet, or maybe only one of our two DB schemes, whatever. Maybe our partner is younger than us and their pensions won't have quite started, but we've both finished working. So that's why it really helps to build a timeline about what is coming in when, like we did in episode two, I think, of this season. So if we're happy with the concept of total return rather than natural income or yield, and we're happy or at least we accept that it's okay for our portfolio to be eroded over time as long as it doesn't happen too fast, and you know, if we're comfortable that our expenses are likely to be highest and our income the lowest in the early years of retirement, then we're in a good place in terms of our mindset as we think about cash flow in retirement. But, you know, that's just the head knowledge. What do we actually need to do? Let's have a look. Okay, the first thing I think will be helpful to do is to track spending carefully as we approach retirement. So we've already noted that spending will change as you groove into retirement. It generally, in my experience, starts highest and then finds a kind of level after at some point in the first five years usually. But that's not to say that you can't look ahead and anticipate now what it might look like then. Obviously, I think the day-to-day -day expenses of running your household won't change that much, obviously. You might be a home more, so maybe the heating bill will go up a bit, but probably not materially. Uh, Work-based expenses like commuting will stop, obviously, as will you know, buying your sandwich from Pret or buying suits or whatever work attire that you wear. Whatever your work attire looks like for you, you won't be buying it anymore. Um, leisure costs will probably rise. You'll take more weekends away, go on more holidays, uh, hopefully anyway. Eat out a bit more, perhaps. Um, depending on your age, though, you might get OAP special prices on your lunchtime specials. Just kidding. Um, I think it's worth taking a closer look at expenditure as you approach a retirement and to be intentional about it. What will continue and what will stop? What spending will fall and what will rise? What ad hoc costs will you maybe incur in the first few years of retirement? I seem to be having a spate of clients, really, that I'm working with who are planning to buy a Tesla when they retire. Um, I even met a lady recently who's 78 years old and considering buying a Tesla. Man, talk about life goals. What's your retirement splurge going to be, if anything? So here's a kind of a thought experiment, or even actually a practical experiment. You could maybe try and live to your anticipated retirement income for a month and see what that looks like. Essentially spending and budgeting as if you're already retired. <laughs> Take notes about the process and maybe see if it feels kind of right and good. Is it enjoyable? There's no point retiring and being miserable, right? So if it's a real burden to live to that level, then you might need to adjust and say, okay, I'm gonna to need to draw more off my capital in order to live a pleasant retirement and not one that feels a bit mean. And then we'll need to see what impact that has for how you invest and how you move your pieces around in advance. Secondly, plan for cash flow management. We're going to need a plan for this, okay? So essentially what that means is where is the money going to come from and when in the early years of our retirement? So let's say you've planned out your timeline and you work out that you're going to need to find capital to top up your income by, I don't know, 20 grand in year one, 10,000 in year two, 15,000 in year three. That's a total drawdown from capital of £45,000 in the first three years of retirement. Now, you have a combination of DC personal pension funds, ISAs, maybe some premium bonds, some money in savings. Where should the money come from? So I think as you head towards the finish line, you want to make sure that your expenditure for the first two years of retirement is in cash or very near cash investments like money market funds, perhaps. This means you're going to need to be keeping an eye on your investment values and working out where and when you should take money out of investments into cash so that you're ready when the time comes. So you should probably be thinking about that in maybe the three years or so before crossing the line 
Why three years? Well, you certainly don't want to leave it until six months before your retirement date. And then, you know, there'd be a big market correction and suddenly you're pulling money out of investments into cash while markets are depressed. A three year period is likely to have enough opportunity for you to pull money out at quotes a good time. As far as where the money should come from, obviously you should have a mind to tax efficiency. You might want to take some or all of the tax-free cash from your pension funds, or you could sell down some of your ISA. Ideally, probably take it from premium bonds, because chances are you're holding too much in a very low return environment there anyway. But unfortunately, this might not be that simple a decision. Uh, I'd love to be able to say, you know, take, take it from pensions first, then ISAs, then cash or whatever, but there's just too many variables here. If, for example, you're likely to have lifetime allowance issues with your pensions down the line, it might serve you well to draw down a chunk of your pension earlier rather than later. The balance to that, of course, though, is that pensions are very inheritance tax efficient. So you might have to choose your tax poison, right? Now or while you're alive with lifetime allowance or after you've died with inheritance tax. Um, obviously, an advisor can help here. That's our job. Remember always that spending is your biggest lever. In the long holiday of your retirement, you're going to need to be prepared to make adult decisions about spending as you go along. And by that, I mean that, you know, if maybe your portfolio has had a very difficult year, thanks to markets, coronavirus or whatever, then maybe you might not increase your spending next year. Or maybe you defer buying the new car or making gifts to the kids. Now, in his book, Beyond the 4% Rule, Abraham Okasanya talks about different rules for spending. For example, only increasing by spending by inflation, only increasing your spending by inflation, if the portfolio has risen in the previous year. So I think you'd be well served perhaps by thinking some of those things through in advance. Even if it is only an abstract thought experiment for now, I think it'll be useful. Third thing you need to do, I've mentioned it before, is to gear up for simplicity. When I'm working with clients, I often draw them a picture, right? I take a blank piece of paper and draw a horizontal line uh, across the middle of it. Below the line are two accounts labeled savings and current. And that's generally the client's domain. That's what they have to manage. Everything above the line is the portfolio. And that consists of investment accounts, pensions, primarily other stuff as well. And that's the stuff that they're very often asking me to look after for them. But if you're not delegating to an advisor, then you're responsible for everything, whether it's above or below that line, both the investing and spending parts of the whole retirement planning piece. Now, for most of you, the bit below the line, savings accounts and current accounts, that will just come as second nature. Planning your spending and your cash flow, moving money between accounts to meet short-term needs. But investing the bit above the line in retirement is a bit more involved than when we're in the wealth building phase of our lives. And as such, we want to make it as easy as possible to stay on top of it. So a couple of weeks ago, we talked about positioning the pieces for retirement. And so if you haven't listened to that, definitely go back and do so. There's just no point in making things more difficult for yourself than it needs to be, really. Simple is always best, and especially as you enter retirement. Get your portfolio ready now so that you can start to move the pieces into the right places before you cross the line. Remember, you're aiming for simplicity and flexibility. So, you know, you can take money easily from different pots at different times, depending on whatever the prevailing winds are at the time. And more to come on that over the next couple of weeks. So just in summary, as you start to think about all this and start moving towards taking action, remember always that your skills don't just like desert you at retirement. The spending habits, the saving habits, the discipline that have enabled you to retire at all don't just sort of turn into compulsive spending overnight, right? Chances are if you've got this far, you will sail into spending your money mindfully, no problem, right? Just because you're changing from saving to spending, the same disciplines essentially apply. So don't be concerned by the prospect of managing your cash flow in retirement. I wanted to kind of highlight some of the things you need to be aware of, but really, if you keep doing what you're doing, keep doing what's got you to this place, you'll be fine. Really, it's the investment piece that's a bit more challenging. Certainly not beyond the realms of possibility for anybody listening to this, though. And we're going to get into the investment bit in the next couple of weeks. Okay, we got a review this week uh, entitled The Best UK Finance Podcast. So uh, thank you very much, Mr. Ryan D, 
who says, I've listened to a lot of finance podcasts, but this podcast has helped me out hugely in my own understanding. And the community behind the podcast adds a whole other level. If you're wondering what he's talking about, meaningfulmoney.tv slash community. Go check it out on Facebook. Uh, since listening, I've started my own investment journey and I've got confidence I'm on the right footing. Pete explains everything in a clear and simple way. I look forward to every single episode. Very cool. Thank you so much, Mr. Ryan D. Um, yeah, so join the community if you're not already. If you like what you're hearing, please leave me a review wherever you're listening to this. If you're on Apple, it's meaningfulmoney.tv slash iTunes. But wherever you're listening, please leave me a review. It massively helps out just because it keeps us near the rankings, which means people can find the show, right? Okay. Uh, yep. Yeah, just a reminder, the first phase uh, of Meaningful Academy is now live and open to everybody. So if you're listening to this thinking, I'm not at the retirement stage yet, I'm just trying to get started and work out a budget and stuff like that, then Financial Foundations, which is the first phase of Meaningful Academy, is going to be perfect for you. The course covers everything from mindset, goal setting, setting and sticking to a budget, eliminating debt, the basics of insurance, saving and investing, everything you need to know really to set your finances off on the right foot. There's video lessons, worksheets, calculators, everything you possibly need. So head over to MeaningfulAcademy.com for everything that you need to know about that. And don't forget that as a podcast listener, you get 25% off by using the coupon code PODCAST25. That's all one word, PODCAST25 gets you 25% off. Can't say fairer than that. Okay, next time we're going to be talking about phasing into retirement. So I've talked a lot about the finish line over the past few weeks. But for many of us, retirement won't be an event. It'll be a process over a period, potentially of a few years. And next week, I want to talk about how that works from a human perspective and also how to plan your finances around a phased retirement. Okay, sound good? Hope so. That's it for this session of the podcast. Hope you enjoyed it. Cash flow's essential. And uh, I'm sure you know that. Any comments or questions, meaningfulmoney.tv slash HS6. Hope you enjoyed it, folks. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate all the feedback you've given me on this season. I'm glad it's hitting the nerve. I nearly said hitting the cord. <laughs> Cheers. I'll talk to you next week.